Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign, Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser 3. Hell on Earth. So yeah. this is this is the the uh, Candyman audio commentary. Woo-hoo. Yeah, yeah. So we're actually Candy almost man. done. I think Candyman. we Candyman, Candyman. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Do it in front yeah. of the mirror. No. <laughs> so I, I think we've got um, only one left, right? A Midnight Me Train is after this, and then that's it. Sure. Oh no, uh-huh. we got Candyman two. And two. Also. Yeah, we got to do Candyman. Then, oh right, because yeah. we did three. Uh, yeah, we did three the uh, during the bad movie section, and now we're doing one and two, and then uh, and then uh, Midnight Meat Train. That's right. Yeah. I just want to let the, our listeners know that we also talked about the Candyman's. Um, that's <laughs> yeah. that's not wrong. It's yeah. actually the title of the episode on episode <laughs> yeah. fifty one, where we talked about Candyman one, two, and three. Right, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. That that was fun. And if you want to hear about The Forbidden, the Books of Blood short story that Clyde Barker wrote, that was back in Episode 10, Books of Blood, Volume 5. So if you go check out those episodes, you will find more stuff about Candyman. All right. Yeah, and there may be some repeated stuff in here because it's been a while since we did those episodes. Sure, sure. It's, it's always fun to go back to Candyman, though. It's, yeah. yeah. It's one yeah, of the most is. successful adaptations of a Clyde Barker story. So um, I, I've got the uh, special edition DVD. I don't think that many people have. There was like a, 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 a Blu-ray in Canada, I think. But when you try to buy it, it's really expensive now. Yeah, yeah it is. And, and I, I'm watching that the Blu-ray edition. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It, I, I, I heard that it looks the same as the, as, the, uh, as the DVD or like the quality wasn't any better. It's it's okay. I it's, think it's I, I think I had, I had read that on like Amazon reviews or something. I can't really tell. Yeah, I mean it's not a hundred percent like crisp HD, I guess. So yeah, you're probably right. Uh, you can see a little bit of grain on it, but for the most part, it's not particularly HD. Yeah. Well, and it, I, Candyman is not surround sound anywhere, right? I think it's two channel stereo. I, not sure. What I have, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's and the, the special edition doesn't give you any uh, any audio features except for like you know dubbing and stuff, and it doesn't uh, so, say it doesn't say what kind of sound it is. So, uh, so what what's the verdict? There is no Blu-ray of Candyman official Blu-ray in America. No, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. not. Twilight. The company Twilight Time owns the rights. I'm the. Uh, usually put out uh, Columbia TriStar uh, movies. Oh. And, uh, they'll probably put out something soon. Or maybe okay. they'll, you know, uh, that'd be maybe Screen Factory, like you were saying, Ron will do something. Yeah, that, that would be really nice. Yeah, I, I'm finding uh, a Candyman Blu-ray, unrated, but yeah, uh, Amazon has a German one. I think this is German. Um there's another one that's eighty-two dollars and ninety-nine cents. Okay, that's a limited edition from Germany as well. Oh wow. Okay, so I guess uh, if you have a Blu-ray of Candyman, it's probably valuable at this point. Yeah, I have it at Mom Paul's at the right at the TriStar like skyline, and then the horse will start flying into the screen or whatever that. Okay. Yeah. And I guess I can do the uh, the countdown when we're ready, oh, so I people think... can. Oh, so people can sync up to the beginning of the movie and sync up to our commentary. As we're getting ready to start this, did, did either of you see this in the theater? I didn't. I was too I did, young. yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Cool. It was a good experience. I got to see it on video, and when I saw it on video, I, uh, it was pretty scary watching it on you know, a little yeah. small room. I don't think I've seen it in the theater. Maybe I've seen it in the theater at, at a later time, like in a movie uh, festival or something. Yeah. So um, I saw part two in the theater. That's all I saw. Uh, I remember buying the VHS tape for part two. Hmm. Yeah. I always like I always like the cover to that or the poster for that movie. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Or with the bees and... Not the bees. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> not... So, so you, got, you got the Pegasus? Yes. Okay. Uh, three, two, one, play. Okay, here, here comes, comes the, the Pegasus. Yeah, his wings look so fake. I know, <laughs> especially yeah. on Blu-ray. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but what are they going to do? I guess they could, re- they could redo him. Good old Tristar. Yeah. So, I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, there was a, a recent article with uh, Bernard Rose about the opening of Candyman that we shared on our uh, Facebook yeah, page. Yeah, yeah. I did see that. I didn't read it, though. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good. They're talking about how, for example, they wanted to make the words that the, the, the credits that come up and down, mm-hmm. they wanted them to actually move in and out of frame continuously, but they discovered that it looked jerky when they tried to do that, so they ended up with the compromise of just having them wash in, stop, oh, okay. and then wash out. It still uh, it still did kind of, like, watching this last night, I was thinking, yeah, it seems like they're trying to make it sort of flow with the traffic and stuff. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there was some influence here by that uh, movie that Philip Glass scored uh, called Kuya Niskati. Mm. There was a bunch of uh, movies like that. Hey, there's executive producer Clive Barker. Yeah, yeah. Clive Barker. He was getting so many daily tapes in his studio. Yeah. I wonder how they would feel about seeing that stuff. and Because this movie seems okay. like it, it comes together so well because of the music. Yeah. And seeing that, seeing all this without the music, it would be, it would be a completely different experience. It's sure. like the John Carpenter score for Halloween. If you didn't have that opening theme oh, with the yeah. pumpkin going in, it just wouldn't play the same. Yeah. And this is the way this movie opens up. You have to, it sets a tone. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think this is probably the strongest music in a Clive Barker movie out of all of them. And recently, uh, I mean, two days ago from this recording, uh, Philip Glass released a uh, a new piece of music for uh, from Candyman. He came up with a Candyman suite for violin and piano that's available on iTunes right now. Oh, it's he, it's a new recording? I think so. Oh, that's cool! Oh. I didn't didn't realize what that was. It oh, said the digi- that digital will release. Yeah, yes, I remember that. It yeah. said uh, on sale for only one dollar ninety nine through Halloween. Oh, I'm gonna uh, get that. Yeah, surprise trick or treat from Philip Glass. So it that... was performed by. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say it was performed by pianist Michael Reisman and violinist Chase Spruill. So ah. I think it was done uh, for this. That um, that opening line. Um, it's, it, it really kind of set the tone, and especially seeing this in the theater made me think, oh, this is going to be super faithful to the story because they're lifting lines right out of the short story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and, always got really uh, fascinated by this thing where it looks like a bunch of bees are just rising up in the city. Yeah. And then nobody talks about that for the rest of the movie. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind yeah. of this cool, mysterious thing that's that's supposed yeah. to intrigue you and and this is uh, th- this opening here is pretty uh, pretty gruesome. So is that Ted Raimi that uh, yes, it Billy? Is. Ted Raimi plays Billy. Yep. I never noticed that until last night. Really? Yeah, and I was like, oh, he's the guy that gets hit in the head with the hammer by. Uh... I first saw it. I thought it was Sam Raimi. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No Sam, but it's, yeah. You know, you, you know I didn't what? know he had a brother at the time. You know, a lot of people get upset about that Walking Dead thing where the the eye popped out. I don't know if this is a spoiler, but it is nobody spoiler. got upset. Nobody got upset when Midnight Meat Train had this guy pop not just one but two eyes out. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they're having sex in a horror movie, so they're gonna die. Yeah, she is. Yeah, because she's burying her breasts. So this this is a, there's an interesting theme here that they sort of lost in all of the in the sequels that that. Uh, these stories may or may not be true, but uh, they're what keep Candyman alive. That's uh, the fascinating part of the Forbidden is yeah. Um, yeah. that actually Candyman was not Daniel Robitaille. He was not this, a painter, a slave. You know, he was just a myth that someone had come up with, and then so many people believed in him that actually he appeared. He ma- materialized. Yeah. yeah. It was like the power of invocation. This entity would appear. Yeah, and building his story bigger and bigger made him more and more powerful. They offered yeah. him sacrifices. Yeah. Like the, with the baby. Isn't that... Right, right, yeah. Which they, they, they sort of cut back from that a little bit in this movie. Yeah. 
and the special me. effects in this movie are from Bob Keane. Oh, wow. That scared me right there when I first saw it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just a good jump scare. There's a it lot reminds of me of that uh, Driller Killer movie. <laughs> I don't know that one. Yeah, I've seen, yeah, I've seen that. Where the, the drill comes through the floor of the, uh, you know, the ceiling, and uh, you see the blood come out. Is that the movie I'm thinking? I think so. So college. Virginia Madison? Yeah, why She's do they, have, why do they have lockers in college? This is like a high school. Yeah. Virginia so, Madison, though, is like, this is the first time I ever saw her. She's very attractive. She's very beautiful. She still is. Uh, yeah. She has an Instagram, uh, at Virginia Madison. Is and she, she has a Twitter account. It's at Madly V. She doesn't look that different now from Candyman. Right. She's working on the designated Survivor TV series now. Oh. And her brother's the actor Michael Madison. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Who was in Mr. Uh, Blonde? Mr. Blonde, you know. Yeah, he was in Hellraiser Six. Not no, the, no, oh, no. That's a different. That's a guy that looks kind of the same. Yeah. Uh, Michael there. Madsen is the guy who cuts the ear off of uh, the guy in yeah. Reservoir Dogs. Right. Wow, there's a lot of students in that hall. Yeah. I've never had a big lecture class like that before. Do you I've guys never think, been to a... Is, is Trevor just, just uh, trying to look like, you know, trying to be smarter than her right now? by Because he, he pro had promised that he wouldn't uh, debunk urban myths in his lecture until she was done and then he's doing it anyway he, he just wants to say I'm he wants to be smug and say I'm better than you and I'm you know you're not as important Maybe. as I am there is a smugness to him yeah, yeah I would agree with that well he does use the excuse that hey I have a curriculum yeah, to yeah. stick to bring that. <laughs> yeah. he does say Shit. that but at the same time if he promised that he wouldn't do it then you know <laughs> then why is he doing it right he shouldn't have promised that then. He should have said, no, you just, you're just going to have to deal with it. It kind of gives us an early idea that Trevor's, you know, not a very faithful uh, no. person. And yeah, I, 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 in, in the short story, I forget, was he was he was it really open that he, he cheated on her and she knew about it? I think so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And here yeah. it's kind of like she suspects it, but she's too scared to say anything about it. Or she's too scared. Well, she says she says. Something, yeah, I guess. She, I guess too scared to push him about it. Like when he, she'll t <laughs> she'll accept whatever answers he gives about it. Well, Stacy kind of just gives her the stink eye right there, and yeah, uh, she's the only student who offers to say hi and shakes her hand. Yeah, and she's the last one to leave. She's yeah. like marking her territory right there. Yeah, doesn't say bye when she says bye. Yeah. <laughs> I like this actor who plays uh, Trevor. I yeah, he's too. not too bad. Yeah, he's done he's a lot of in... stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like his performance. I mean, I, maybe it's just the way the ending works, but the, the way when he says Helen five times in the mirror just seems so forced. I think he looks in pain when he says that. Yeah, well, I, really I think do. that's I think what was good in that moment. I think they, 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 that's what they were going for, but, you know, have, you know, it's it's a real stretch to have to do it five times to... Sure, sure. But yeah, I know what you we're, mean. we're not there yet, though. So, um, was this movie being done at the same time as Lord of Illusions? Um, no, I think it was being done at the same time as Hellraiser 3. Yeah, I saw oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I remember that distinctly. The first movies, Clive Barker related movies I ever saw in the theater were uh, Hellraiser 3 and Candyman, and they were in the same year. Yeah. Because I think uh, it was. It had been a long time since there was another Clive Barker movie. I think like eighty or ninety for for Nightbreed. Yeah, this is ninety two. Yeah, and you can tell it's ninety two because she's using like uh, some word processor, like WordStar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. Terrible, yeah, no. primitive. Yeah. 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 Later on, when she's calling Trevor and he's not home, they sort of focus on the nightstand. I'm like, oh, hey, there's an Amiga five hundred on their on her nightstand, and then they close. <laughs> yeah. the, they zo <laughs> zoomed in on it, and it was a typewriter. Oh, I got you. <laughs> so uh, this reminds me. Uh, do you guys remember when it was announced that Clive was maybe getting involved in something called Creepy Pasta? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah I do. It was going to be about. Before. Yeah, it was going to be about this kind of like not urban legends, but more like uh, internet 
internet legends that were written down, like Slender Man. Yeah. yeah. From, I think Slender Man came from the Something Awful forums or something like that. And and then they said, oh, Clyde Barker is going to work for Creepypasta. And I was going to, yeah. you know, I thought that was weird because nobody else ever mentioned anything about that. But um, it's another. Uh, I think that would be perfect for him to do some stuff like that. It's yeah. another Zombies yeah. versus Gladiators. Could be another one of those projects. Yeah, just fell to the wayside. Yeah, and sometimes I sometimes I think it'd be better if if the public didn't hear about some of these things. Yeah. All right, so here comes another urban legend. Yeah. And uh, Cabrini Green. I mean, of course, uh, I'm sure a lot of people know this, but it, it was a real place. It was. Yeah. Yeah, a real uh, neighborhood that got torn down years ago. We'll add some show notes uh, about Cabrini Green. There's a lovely photo essay from uh, Time Magazine. The the apartments in there look horrible. I mean, they they it, yeah, they, yeah. It, they look like they you know, that people shouldn't be allowed to be to live in them. Like it's a condemned building. It, yeah. it, except for Anne Marie's apartment looks decent, but every all the other ones, like where Jake is sleeping, it looks like he's sleeping in a burned out shell. Just trash. Yeah. He's sleeping on trash. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's all. It was a seventy acre complex on Chicago's north side. It was um it's pretty old. So the the, the interiors uh were really apartments of, of a building or I thought maybe they built sets. They really shot in I don't building. know. I'm and and did, did Bernard Rose write this adaptation? Yeah, he did. Yeah, and I thought, you know, at at first it was so different from... Um, but it's kind of like Midnight Me Train, that it's... The way it's ad- adapted is so smart that it, 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 it works and it's cool. Yeah, the guy uh, who plays Trevor, Xander Berkeley, and I just remember his name. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. He played John Connor's stepfather in Terminator Two. That's where. Oh I right! Oh man, yeah. I, I didn't. I just. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Get your ass to school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go help your mom. Yeah. She's not my mother, Todd. <laughs> and he, he got the worst death in that movie because the T one thousand kills him by just you know ramming like that blade to his mouth. In the milk carton. Yes. 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 Yeah. And then uh, the kid, the, the kid from T two, ended up playing um, uh, uh, Pet Cemetery two or something. Oh god. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. Did. yeah. I've heard that he was pretty full of himself on set while he was doing that movie because he had been in T two. So. Oh. What Edward Furlong? Yeah. Yeah. So here she's doing some. So um, so the building she's living is based off the. The same kind of structure that... Yeah, I didn't quite Green. understand that. So how far away is she from Cabrini Green? I guess just across the tracks or across whatever. Well, I think they're just saying that this, yeah, this building that? was supposed to be like another uh, uh, social... Um, yeah, another project. Another project, yeah. But they, they put plaster on the walls and sold them as condos. So here's the thing. What are they doing... In regards to Candyman, I mean, what what are they doing? Is there like a, a, a like a, a thesis. PhD thesis? A thesis. But uh, yeah, usually like thesis that. are personal, right? It's not like a group thing. So I'm just wondering why does she that's, have a colleague to work well, with? Well, yeah, maybe Bernadette is like a, an assistant or something. Could be. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because she's a teacher, right? Uh, Virginia Madsen, Helen. She's a teacher. Well, I, I think she's a grad student. Oh, okay. No, yeah, they but, are, but I guess together. grad grad students are are teachers a lot of the time. But the the thing that always bugged me about this scene here is that they push in the the you know the pharmacy or the mirror <laughs> thing yeah thing on the other side, and it's like that could who's going to put it back? <laughs> you know, yeah, and that could have shattered yeah. over there when they did that, and it could have fell over and shattered on the floor, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't really. Nobody's on the other side holding it, so it's kind of weird when she kind of pushes it out. Yeah. But, you know, that's just irrelevant. Yeah. So that's that's really strange, though, oh, that people would leave those openings in walls just because of the bathroom. 
there are some there are some dumb things along the way that Helen does that sort of set her whole you know future in motion, and this is one. This is the first one. Oh yeah, Candyman. And of course, Tony Todd. For me, uh, the first uh, contact with Tony Todd's work was uh, The Crow. For me. Oh, okay. And what Platoon year was, was The for Crow? Me. Was the ninety three? Ninety four. Ninety four. Okay. Mm-hmm. But mom was Tony Todd was or no Nine Living Dead remake. Yeah, me, me too. Night, yeah, yeah. Night of the Living Dead that's remake. That's what I saw. Um. Yeah. He, yeah, see, I thought that was an Amiga 500, but then they zoom in on it closer, oh. and it's a, it's a typewriter. Typewriter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they still used it back then. This was another good little scare I remember when I first watched yeah. it. It's kind of I mean, cheap. Who the hell does that? Uh, it's, there, it's cheap, man. Yeah, man, there's another one with a dog barking, too. Yeah. If I did that, my wife would kill me. Yeah, I know. It's not cool. Get a punch in the face. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, yeah. But it, one th- one thing that bugged me, and I mean, we're gonna do Candyman too. But there were, there are jump scares in there where it's just like a black person. And, oh yeah, it's like yeah, it's like know. oh, that's not Candyman. That's just a different black guy. Yeah, that was and my biggest like, complaint yeah, about it that. Seems like, yeah, that seems a little racist. To, you know, they did that like every like ten minutes. In that movie. I know. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it looks yeah. like yeah, they play onto that yeah idea that you know. If you're white, you're going to be afraid of this guy because he's in a dark corner and he's black. And it's, yeah. it, you're right; it does feel a little racist. I guess at the same time, it could be a commentary on that, but I don't know. It, it, well, the, there, the movie, the rest of the movie is pretty good. Well, there's your answer. She lives eight blocks away from Cabrini Green. Oh, okay. She, now this she has... was... oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. No, I was just I was just gonna say she seemed pretty enthusiastic about the whole thing, and now that they're actually on the way there, she's having second thoughts. I, I know she was well, all she, excited, and now she's got like eight hundred different forms of mace in her purse. The reality of it yeah. <laughs> being down in this kind of area is probably hitting her. What were you gonna say, Rob? This actress that plays uh, Bernadette is a uh, done a lot of TV work, and Wasn't I don't know she if y'all like a Playboy are y'all Van Damme fans. She might have been. I thought I, there I was know. a big like controversy about that that she was some kind of play playboy model oh you're talking about lisa bonet no that's not her no i thought it was bernadette oh okay no this is a casey lemons but she was in hard target oh if y'all seen hard target how does it feel to be hunted you tell me yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) silence of the lambs she was also in silence of the lambs oh wow that's right that's another movie you're right I must be confusing her with somebody else. She played uh, Sterling. <laughs> she was another buddy. She has, she always plays little roles, I guess, sidekicks of people. She was yeah. like, uh, the sidekick of uh, Jodie Foster's in that movie. And she was even in The Cosby Show, where she played, according to IMDb, Miss McKegney. Oh. That show was go. on for a long time. I bet they had a lot of guest stars. Yeah. I was looking back at some family ties, and they had a ton of guest stars. These guys are kind of dressed like the '80s, but I guess yeah. the, the '80s weren't like that, '80s rappers. Uh-huh. Yeah, '80s like like Rum DMC. Yeah, but I guess the '80s right. weren't that far back from '92. Nobody has a big watch hanging from their neck, though. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's yeah. Two two women going in there. It's pretty brave or pretty stupid. I can't tell. Sure, sure not the popo, please. Yeah, yeah popo. Um, and that one guy has a super deep voice. He's like, hey, who are you trying to see? Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're right. You're looking for Candyman, bitch. <laughs> bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lineup scene is hilarious with all the guys saying that line. Yeah, they, they seem really uncomfortable. You'll get to it later. It. Yeah. So this, I don't know if this is a set or this if this was shot on location, so I have no idea. If yeah. anybody knows, just leave us a comment. Jeez, yeah, the way this building is treated, you'd think that um, you'd think it would be condemned. Yeah, nothing a little uh, whitewash wouldn't fix. Yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, so the projects were always like uh, they always cut corners when building projects, and yeah, it, it would have those cinder block stairways. They wouldn't bother like paint them or anything. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, bathrooms would have bad plumbing. Yeah, and somebody spray painted right on top of Anne Marie's door. Yeah, sweets for the sweet. Yeah, it's all part of the mystique, Ryan. It's all part of the uh, the social. I'm trying to come up with some uh, <laughs> PhD terms. Yeah. Yeah, the social uh, impact of the urban legends, I guess. Yeah, not a good idea to go into an abandoned building in an in apartment block controlled by gangs. Yeah. Yeah, you, you would definitely find something in there. Yeah. Even if it's just like a pile of dirty laundry and yeah, or people probably use it to to squat. do drug deals or yeah, squatting. And vagrant, yeah, vagrant kind yeah. of you know behavior. Uh, yeah, even if they're not there now, they might come in anytime. And they can close the door behind them, and they're trapped. Yeah, right. I guess it just adds to the tension. Yeah. So that's where the little girl got killed, or the baby. Yeah. So was Ruth Regina a little girl, or was she an older, a middle-aged woman, or I can't remember what they said at the beginning. Was she a little girl? Uh, no, Ruthie Jean was an adult, and she had a baby. Oh, oh okay. So you go, when they, go ahead. When they, when, when they show the painting here that's painted on the other side of the wall around the hole to make, like, a big mouth... Um, I always, I always had a different vision of what it, it was supposed to look like. Oh, because, from uh, the short story. Yeah, from the short story, it's described almost like this mouth, like with his head thrown back, and it's like yelling, and there's big bug eyes and like hair that's painted on the wall and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And and then here they went the other approach. They just went with like, you know, Tony Todd's face, like the, the Candyman. So. But it's definitely much more intimidating when when you read the, the short story. In Candyman, in the short stories, his, his skin is kind of yellowish. Described as yellowish, isn't it? I think kind so. Of a yellowish kind of tone to it, waxy. Yeah, he's not really like a. a his coat. Well, I mean, he doesn't spider. have like a pen. He doesn't have like a pen coat. His, his coat is very. Well, I can't remember. I'd have to go back to look in the the story, but his coat was different. <laughs> well, the the only thing that I I think that the Candyman movies got right was that. What they added to it kind of made it their own, and it made it pretty interesting. Yeah. I really like the whole idea of Daniel Robitaille being a painter, and they yeah. had a forbidden affair with, like, a white lady from, you know, a white daughter from a plantation owner, and then he smeared, uh, you know, they cut his hand and that smeared him with honey, and the bees killed him. I think that's really well thought of you know it's, it's kind of funny she's using helen's coat to, to to put over the filth on that bathtub so she can sit yeah. down <laughs> she's like you put me in this position i'm gonna ruin your coat uh, yeah but yeah i agree i think that um i think that the only really the only way to make a full movie and to and and a series out of this was to expand the mythology a little bigger than what was in the short story yeah I love that reveal. That's a great reveal. Yeah, yeah, and of course it's you ran out design. of film. Yeah. Now this uh, thing with the candy too—that's from a story, if I recall. With the razors, isn't that? Oh yeah, yeah, right. That's that's right candy. out of the short story, and that's n at never, the end. There's goes. nothing else explained about that. It's just a weird, creepy thing in this movie. Yeah. I like this moment where she kind of feels woozy by looking at Candyman. It's like something's yeah. passing between them. Yeah. You know. Every time she sits, gets around him, she feels that way. Yeah. yeah. That kind of touches on the candy with, like, you ever heard of that old urban legend of people Oh, yeah. Getting, yeah, that was really big kinda, when I was a kid. Um, that, you know, that you would, you, people would... But it was, it was just a legend, right? Yeah. Nobody really did that, did they? I never... I, I mean, mean I, ne I only heard it secondhand, like an urban... I think it happened with, yeah. between a family one time. And I'm, okay. You, you're talking... I don't know much about Halloween, but you're talking about a, an urban legend that someone was putting uh, can, can, razors and candy and, uh, and then apples. By the, I, heard, yeah, I heard apples. 
yeah, I heard the apples too. And then by the you know by the time kids get home, they don't know where who gave them what. So, right. Yeah. Because I remember my I got a rock. Parents. Huh? I got a oh. rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, I got to buy Halloween candy. Have you guys bought Halloween candy for kids? Yeah. 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 Right. Like a big bad mixture of stuff. It's just it's here in a few days. Wow, yeah, right. I'll be 37. Your birthday is right. Halloween? Yeah. I had forgotten that. Wow. That's a cool day for, uh, for a birthday. You I'll get to party you. every year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dress up. What are you gonna What are you gonna dress up this Halloween, Rob? Uh, I've got I bought this uh, clear, creepy, uh, clear uh, mask. Uh, mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of oh, okay. it's like a female mask. I'm gonna put over uh, over that a white mask. Okay. I, I'm just doing a random thing. It's just nothing. Nothing. It's just kind of a custom. And I'm gonna do a. Uh, uh, wear like a, a long trench coat. Wow. Have like a, a knife or something. I don't know. I was just come up with some something quick off the top of my head. Okay. I thought you might be like the Joker or something because you had that mask. That that mask you can't wear that mask. Oh. You know, the way he made he the way he made it you just put it up on. I wanted it to to display it. Sure. So he just made it to where I could display it. Okay. I'm gonna be the Motorhead War Pig. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, I saw that mask you were. I didn't know what that was. I didn't. I'd never, I didn't know the motor yeah, that's in the band. It's all, no, it's always on, that design in some way or another is always on the, the Motorhead album covers. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's always like, a that, that, like a mascot sure. kind of a thing. Like a Eddie from um, Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden, yeah. Thank you. And the uh, resident metalhead uh, uh, helped yeah. me out. These, cool. um, I always wondered where her dog went in this, you know, in this scene here. She just like oh. the dog conveniently disappears for the for this scene. Yeah, that's a that's a good catch, you know. A dog like that wouldn't leave them. <laughs> no, and it'd probably be barking yeah. and bugging them and stuff. I mean, I guess yeah. you could have locked him in the bedroom. That's a pretty what? nice looking little studio apartment, though. Yeah, it kind of brings that contrast that you know between expectation and reality. Uh, and, and not everybody in a project is going to be, you know, marginalized or it's going to be like a, a criminal or anything. Yeah. yeah, I hate how people get, you know, put into that box just because they live in a bad area that everybody's bad. But sure. I, I would have hoped that she, you know, once that murder happened next door, she would find a way to get out of there. Yeah, maybe it's not that easy, you know, yeah. when you're But she's just poor. trying to do it's her like, best because she's... Obviously, working at a grocery store that probably yeah. doesn't pay very much. Her, a, a woman and a baby got murdered in the apartment next door to her, and she's a woman with a baby. She just thought getting right. a big dog would be enough. That's why she's saying that she's scared. Yeah. yeah. Candy. Now, in, in the short story, uh, she's not a very sympathetic character, if I remember. That. Uh, oh yeah. Mother. And and in the short story, um, Purcell had, her baby like a, for sacrifice. had like a, a like a teenage boy with him in this dinner scene. Yeah, I love that dude with the long hair. He's in I the did. second movie a lot. Yeah, and it's just he's just a great character. I love this dude. He uh, looks like Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. I forgot his name. Uh, he's. Uh, I forgot his name. He's worked with uh, Bernard Rose before. He might have been in that, but Bernard Rose did a Beethoven biopic movie called Immortal Beloved, and uh -huh. I think he might have had a small role in it. Hmm. Okay, yeah. That line, abs ab actually, Purcell, we're about to bury you, seems a little out of place. Now she's just, you know, letting him know that, you know, F you, man, we don't, we're not scared of you. Yeah. Purcell... Professor Philip Purcell. It was played by Michael Culkin. Yeah, Michael Culkin. And he does come back for the sequel, right? Doesn't he get bumped oh, off yeah. at the beginning? Yeah, yeah he, he gets bumped off at the beginning. Actually, looking at his IMDb page, it's interesting. Michael began his screen career in 92 with the horror film Candyman. This was oh. his first movie. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. He must have been a, yeah, but I bet he was a theater actor. Sure, yeah. yeah he was a veteran like actor it. of film, screen, and theater. He was British. Yeah, this is this is where they flesh out the whole thing. Yeah. I like the way he tells it. It's just something very it reminds me of uh uh how my grandfather would tell a story. You know. Oh, okay. Very kind of detail you know, he, it's it sucks you in, you wanna to listen to it, you know, just the way with his voice. Uh huh. What was your grandfather's name? Uh Edward. Okay. Uh, I always wanted Edward, to ask Gar you. Edward Gardner. Oh, okay, gotcha. I always wanted to ask you, right now, is that like French or something? No, it's German. German, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Hey, Dan Hauser's German too. Uh, yeah. Austrian, yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. My name means piglet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Late tongue in Portuguese means piglet. So, I guess well, I'm Joe Piglet. I've always wanted to look up what my name means. How do you find that out? You'll have to tame me later. Yeah, sure. Uh, I like this lighting scene here. Yeah. They only have like a sliver of light kind of diffused over her face. She was Princess Irulan in Dune as well. Oh, yeah, she wow. Opens the movie up. Oh, that's, yeah, <laughs> she that's has, right. It's a small, short, but very important uh, role because she opens the movie. Yeah, uh, 1980, right? Or 1984. 84, okay. Yeah, because I did see that in the theater. Oh, you saw Dune in the theater? Yeah, nobody was there. Nobody. Wow. Or, oh, that's a shame. Wasn't that R-rated? I forget. No, it's PG-13. It's PG oh, is it? Okay. I thought the first PG-13 movie was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yeah, it was, but... So, I mean... Or maybe it was PG. Okay. I have the DVD. I'll have to check only after the, yeah. after this. Watch this. I have it. Cause this, I know it wasn't R because we saw it. Yeah. I'm wondering... They said that um, Candyman, or Daniel Robitaille, he was uh, killed, and then they burned his ashes and scattered them over Cabrini Green. But... I guess he's talking about the location. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if that particular place had like plantations and stuff like that back in the 1800s. Right. Or if that, yeah. You yeah. Know what I'm well, and then this whole story sort of moves to. I was thinking about that too because this whole story moves to. Um, what do you call the it? South. Yeah, it moves Louisiana. to New Orleans. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I was trying to think. Does that make sense, that transition from here to New Orleans? I don't know. Well, it could be that it's just part of the urban legend and it's not yeah. true. But that could be it right. as well. Yeah. I, I took that as like the urban legend can go where it wants to. Yeah, yeah. good point. It, it expands everywhere. That little kid looks fleek at the end of the movie. He's got a little bow tie. And I looks, know. Yeah. yeah. He's got a cool looking hat too. I always yeah. that that ending. I always kind of wondered was that um, were, were they were they giving paying her respect that she helped kill the Candyman or were they or were they giving I, her the, the hook to I say always, that you you are the new Candyman now? That uh, I I think I, the, really, the the first thing that you said. I think yeah. Because he, he Jake did see Candyman's body in the fire. Mm -hmm. They probably don't do that in movies now where an adult is telling a kid it's it'll be our secret. Yeah, it's right. kind of weird and creepy. Yeah. According to uh, Bernard Rose in that recent article that when they shot this, I think it was November in Chicago and it was absolutely freezing. That's why they always have these thick coats. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, he said it was so cold that it snapped the film a couple of times. Jeez. God. That's bad, yeah. man. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I've, 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 I've seen real film and held it. It's really thick. And and he, and he was actually uh, in the helicopter with the helicopter pilot when they were shotting those uh, first, uh, the opening for the movie. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, People and in the future like, will probably... Shots in the film. People yeah. in the future will probably just think all those shots were done by a drone. 
Well, there were no drones at the time. Well, but yeah, yeah, nowadays they would saying. be able yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah now and if the pilot like... told Bernard Rose, you're going to fall out, it's not a good idea. And he was like, yeah, I've had enough to. So he, they just landed the helicopter and let the helicopter pilot rig that camera to the helicopter and do it himself. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> This is a gruesome graphic uh, story. Yeah. It certainly has some very well-crafted uh, flashbacks. You know, the yeah. flashbacks really, they look like another movie. I like that, that, that tough guy. That, old, that tough guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. It, it feels like, like it's the 70s. Hand. He's not telling a story from the 70s, though, but it feels like it's from the 70s. Yeah. yeah. That he's got that leather jacket. And he's got yeah. yeah it's just, and and, the, and the, the color tone of that video yeah, the color is like kind of yellowish like a 70s that. movie. Yeah. Agree. That's what it does. It's John Shaft. Oh, God. That is so, yeah, that's, so that's, brutal. That disturbed, that disturbed me when I, was, yeah. when I first saw it. Wow, yeah. And I didn't understand what he meant. When, like He's like, they found it floating in a toilet. I was like, what's he talking about? I was yeah. like, oh, he's talking about a little kid's uh, private parts. Yeah. And the little kid says very nonchalantly, can't fix that, better, better off, off dead. dead. Yeah. 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 It's like, damn, kid, you're cold-blooded. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Helen, why do you have to do stupid things? Yeah. Now she's going into a public public restroom for men. Uh, yeah. There's shit all over the wall. Yeah, and, and in a way, I mean, all of you know this non-believing stuff is kind of this guy's fault. The, the, this uh, this phony candy man that comes along. Mm-hmm. Sweets for the sweet. I mean, why do that to your to the bathroom in your own neighborhood? Jesus. Yeah. Bathrooms are the. Bathrooms like that are the worst places to go. I would never enter a bathroom. Though this like is that. probably the worst bathroom I've ever seen, and that includes like Tijuana. Oh, Train, boy. Trains Potting had the, one of the bathrooms, <laughs> worst bathrooms I've ever. Yeah, seen. Yeah, so I was gonna bring that <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, worst that, toilet in Scotland. Like, didn't they use like crap to write on the walls there? Yeah, Rob yeah. just said that. I don't know. I don't know if they use real crap for real. Or not. No, well, no, I, but I, I think that's yeah. what they're that's what they're going for, though. That's what they're going for. Sure. Yeah. Ugh. This looks like a set. It's just this totally like... caked on. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a set. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like the, this, the if, a, if a bathroom was really like this... It looks like, like there's this, a pile they, of crap next to the toilet, It, it would have been chained up and, and condemned, right? I mean, you people would, they sure. wouldn't expect anybody to use that. Right. I mean, if you look at the photo essay on the Time magazine about Cabrini Green, though, there were some pretty, like... It was pretty drab. It was pretty drab. You know, they had gardens and stuff when they opened it, but then nobody maintained the gardens. Oh. Uh, the city didn't care about it. It was like, all right. That's usually what happens in in social projects, you know. They just yeah. make them as cheap as possible, and then it's just, all right. Hey, look at the man, bitch. Yeah. If they only... If they had only cast Eddie Murphy as the Candyman, this movie would be completely different. <laughs> you gosh. Yeah. Uh, Have Uwe Boll direct it. Yeah. Well, he retired from directing. <laughs> he just said he had retired yesterday. There, he said it. Yeah. yeah. He really whacks her too upside the head. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and that sound. Yeah, you should see her eyes really swollen in the next shot too. They. Yeah. Really... It's good makeup. And, and yeah. even after she gets better, one of her pupils is all red, and the it, when the other ones or one of her eyes is red and the other one's blue. Yeah, this is a lot. I, I can't. This for some reason I laugh at this scene. Oh, this they, lineup. Yeah, these guys. Yeah, but yeah, just the guys are saying it. This guy, too, right? Yeah, here, like, like, I, I, I look at the camera, man, bitch. <laughs> yeah, another movie that starts with something like this is The Usual Suspects. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. It's got a lineup where we meet every single character in the movie. They use it differently, but, oh, man, look at that makeup. Yeah. Um, Bob King. Yeah, it looks so real. Uh-huh. I was going to ask, is that the, the 
the same actor from Hellraiser 5? No, it's not. Never mind. Or 6, you're talking about, yeah, he looks kind of like a, that cop, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's not him. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I think this guy's a little older. Yes. It seems like in this movie, nobody went later on when he when he arrests her or whatever. Nobody really ever gives her a chance to tell her story. You never once see her telling somebody, "No, I met this guy in the garage and I passed out and then I woke up and the blood." And it's like everybody Maybe she already just, said that. Yeah, it's, it could be just off, you know, off camera or whatever, out of the not, you know, wasn't filmed. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. That scene after she gets arrested. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's she's like she's trying to tell him she's like, "I was attacked." You don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, and then they she, just yeah, she just gets kind of dragged around and put here and do the, sit down and do this and you know, there's no like interrogation or it's kind of like if we all kind of know that you did it or you're. Yeah. I don't want to be involved in this. Yeah. Yeah. He's mad. He's really giving her a fucking, like, you know, yeah. shit look. Stink eye. Yeah. So uh, Clyde Barker said that this was Bernard Rose's baby from the beginning. So they, they shared an agent mm-hmm. at CAA, and Clyde Barker had seen Paper House, and he liked it. And so, um, yeah. And I, I think... He got this project. I think this is the second pivotal kind of like a uh, terrible moment for, for Helen right here, convincing Jake that Candyman isn't real. Mm-hmm. I think that's yeah. kind of like, all right, that's it. I'm coming after you. That could be a catalyst. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, cause what well, Jake was going to say that go repeat that to people in the project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, his, without his congregation, he's nothing. Yeah. Here's a quick bit of trivia, uh, from Fangoria 146. September 95. I think it was Clyde Barker saying, I remember at the first Candyman test screening, Bernard Rose went as drunk as a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> I know, which I know I, I read that same interview. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you say this you, movie had a different ending to it. We'll get to that later, but David Anderson was telling me in the, uh, the soundtrack linear notes that this had a different ending to it. Huh. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll have to remember to get back to that. Yeah, and, and Jose, you um, you were putting in the into the show notes because you had found the Siskel and Ebert uh, review of of Candyman, which it seems like it was weird. I, I just watched it before we started here, and and uh, and and uh, Ebert was really positive about it until Siskel was like, oh, "I don't like Candyman. He looks like a pimp." And uh, yeah. and then and, yeah. and then and then Ebert started going off on on uh, well, you know, I think that they had one idea for this movie, and then. Some producer told him to put more gore in it, and Siskel was like, yeah, true. yeah, that's right. And it's like, where are you guys getting this from? Yeah, they didn't read the story. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there would ever need to be a director's cut of Candyman, because I think they made it exactly the way they wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, Clyde Barker uh, grew up on listening to this sort of, like, urban legend stories. For example, there was a spring Jack that was supposed to be this um, almost Batman-like figure that would jump out from Liverpool ceilings and stuff that his grandma used to tell him about while they were in the fireplace. Mm. And um, he grew up on those kind of stories. And I guess that's kind of what kind of inspired him into doing, like, The Forbidden. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to say this for sure, but I think I remember him mentioning something about that. So um, if, if I find that particular interview, I'll, I'll let you know. I don't think that Candyman looks like a 70s pimp. I think that either. Especially, you know, that jacket. Yeah. I know it probably kept Tony Todd. I'm glad to... I bet Tony Todd was probably glad to work since, you know, Jose was saying how cold it was. <laughs> yeah, was right. Yeah, right. Absolutely. But yeah, it definitely makes an a crazy it makes an impression, you know. I mean, yeah. it's imposing. It's very striking. Thing. Yeah. Other movies, I don't think they use the same jacket though. I think for the third one, it's a cheaper looking jacket. Yeah. Right. The second yeah. one is a more black. It yeah. lacks the 
the collar. Yeah, and then the third one looks bad. Yeah, it's really just a... And the hook looks bad, too. Yeah, everything in the third movie was bad. Yeah. This is really interesting, this thing where he sort of mesmerizes her and, and uh, she sort of gets dizzy and passes out. And you're right by saying that uh, her telling Jake that Skinny Man isn't real uh, might have might have uh, been the catalyst for this because he says, uh, you doubted me, and, and so I was obliged to come. Now I must shed innocent blood. Yep. They had a bee wrangler for this movie. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were joking, Jose, but Eddie Murphy was originally the choice for Candyman? I was joking. I mean, I was <laughs> it says Eddie Murphy was the original choice for the role of Candyman on Wikipedia. Oh my God, that's but hilarious! But the filmmakers could not afford him. I promise, I did not. I write thought that you into were, I, I, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that would oh, have been a mis- that would have been a mistake. It would have definitely been a different movie, though. I'll yeah. tell you that. Yeah. To be fair to Eddie for Murphy, he really wanted to be taken seriously more as an actor. Uh, that movie Vampire in Brooklyn he wanted that to be scarier and, oh the yeah didn't want it to be. They want it oh, to the, be. yeah they're probably like hey we got an Eddie Murphy movie so let's make it you know funny or whatever I can imagine but, but, him going like um, saying be my victim <laughs> yeah like <laughs> <laughs> oh gross look at that oh, oh. Yeah. oh. pretty Dude. disturbing man yeah I, and and I, I I, I kind of want to know what happened here. Like, who who went and like dumped the dog blood into the baby's crib? Candyman. Yeah. It was but that's Candyman. a weird. I mean, why is the crib filled with blood? Because the blood is all from the dog. Right. So this is well. The obviously, there's too much blood. A dog doesn't have that much blood. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, but. But you ne- you should never ever pick up a murder weapon from the floor. Never. I know. Yeah. And, she, and she does it a few times. Oh, oh God! Oh, poor, uh, man, yeah. Poor Anne Marie. Just making it worse. Yeah. Surprised MPA let them keep that in the movie. Yeah. Stuff like that. You know. I was surprised a lot of the blood they let them keep in this yeah. movie. It was. It's kind of weird. Candyman's you know, in, pretty gory. Yeah. In. Um, and in, in in horror movies, you can have people getting de- decapitated or blow explode or whatever. But if you show something that people can relate to more, it's 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 way more gruesome. Like just getting her getting like slashed in the arm. I mean, I think they had to make a few cuts in this, and I think the Blu-ray that Jose was talking about earlier, it actually does have a few seconds of gore when that doctor, when she gets interviewed later, was killed. Oh, yeah. But that's all they had to cut, I think. Yeah, like blood coming out of his mouth and stuff like that. I yeah. Think. Yeah. They really, really cast the perfect, like, female officer for this scene. Yeah, right. She, she looks in, uh, really, like, big and mean and, yeah. you know, like, movie sweater. She was in Jason Goes to Hell. Is, uh, oh, really? The, uh... She does she look was the cook. She was the cook in that movie of the oh, restaurant. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Does somebody end up with her face put into like hot oil or something? She played the the wife of that guy of the okay. guy you're talking about. She had her face like like because she talked so much in that movie. She got her face like elbowed to her, you know, her teeth were just shoved through her mouth. Oh jeez, jeez, good death. You know what's the best the best kill I've seen in like a Jason movie? It's that uh, um, uh, the Price Fighter, the, the 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 boxer guy, Julius. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's Manhattan one. Oh, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. Jason. I He's love like, that. He, yeah, he goes like he punches Jason like a few times, and then Jason like punches him, and his head falls. Uh, He's like, take your best shot. <laughs> yeah, and the and the head just goes up in the air. Falls on a ceiling and then goes all the way down and falls into a dumpster and the dumpster closes itself or something. It's yeah, that's pretty hard. Just hilarious. That was, great. that was great. But that scene that we just saw here in Candyman is pretty intense. Um, yeah, Virginia Madsen really showing her acting chops. Yeah, and it at is. that at that point of the movie, you know, the, the one thing I guess that always sort of bugged me about this movie is that I don't like it when a, a good character gets set up. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, in this movie, she never really gets redeemed. Not 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 very well. I mean, I don't. I think most people still believe that she's guilty. Well, because you know they caught her red-handed, literally. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. She exactly. even she even you know used a meat cleaver on Bernard. De- not Bernard, yeah. but the other yeah. um, the, the lady. So it's yeah. like the cops got there and they caught her in the act. It's like, yeah. they, of course they would believe she's guilty. You know? Yeah, Candyman uh, set her up really well. And who is yes. that in that picture? And why is that girl student right there next to her? Or is that a picture of, of Helen? That's when Virginia she was Madsen. Young? Yeah. Uh, that, so that picture of her with the long hair was Virginia Madsen when she was young? Yeah, you can tell that it's her. I mean, in the Blu-ray, you can tell. Okay. Trevor's such a jerk. Yeah. He's off, you know, being a bad boy. Yeah. With, you know. But you have to appreciate the extra mile on the set design. They even went and got like a picture of a, a wedding picture to put on the nightstand and stuff. That's yeah. attention to detail right there. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of lame Siskel and Ebert saying this should have been a psychological thriller instead of what it is, and this, all this gore isn't necessary. I think gore is necessary because, you know, movie violence is not real violence. I mean, this is something that keeps popping up. People go like, oh, movie violence is bad for, for people and kids and stuff. It's like, well, yeah. movie violence is not real violence, for starters. It's, yeah. you know, you can't say that this movie's violent because it seems violent to you because they've done their job, you know, yeah. they've done their job of making it believable. But, you know, it, I don't think, I think there's an entertainment value to movie violence. I mean, and I'm not I, going to go get a hook and then start. Right. Going to with yeah. You, you know? Yeah, exactly. There's, there's an element of, of art in the, the vi- cinematic violence that uh, you can't deny. It's, it's part of the story. It's meant to shock. It's meant to yeah. give you an emotional response. And, uh, yeah, the responsibility of the person, I think, you know? Of course. Or individual you know. person. You take that individual. Obviously, you know, Ryan, you wouldn't play this movie for your kid. I mean... Right, obviously. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's Although, not really, yeah. It, Although, it, uh, I think every one of us has seen movies we weren't supposed to see when we were yeah. kids, but we grew up to be perfectly functional individuals. I don't want to, yeah, hurt anybody. Joey's only right. seen probably like three movies in his whole life so far. My nephews used to grow up looking at the pinhead bus that we had back home. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and I would just pick up my, my nephew and be like, he'd be touching the pins and laughing at me. It's like, hey. And I'm like, yeah, it's pinhead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've traumatized the kid. Joey's asked about pinhead, too. He's like, who is that guy? Why does he have those in his head? And it's like, hey, that's really hard to explain. Yeah. I think Trevor may not believe her. Yeah. Or at least he's probably thinking, hey, I hit the jackpot, now I can divorce my wife. Yeah. Here's what Bernard Rose had to say about Candyman, that he's a romantic character, a dark, handsome lover who demands total surrender. I guess that's one way of looking at it. Dark, handsome lover that demands total surrender. All you got to do is die. If you love the Candyman, then you'll die. Nice curtains. Jose, I'm going to send you a message real fast about the original ending of the movie. Okay. I just had to find it. It's in the podcast. Planning. Okay. Gotcha. So Bernard Rose also says that I wanted Candyman to get away from the rape fantasies that one associates with slasher movies. Helen deals with her desires when she summons the Candyman. She's like a priest who's always asking for God. But what would happen if God appeared and said, here I am? That might be what the priest wants, but it could also drive him mad. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, there's there's a sort of a, a connecting thread here with other Clive Barker stories where people are, are curious and they poke into things that they don't understand and then, and then it... Uh, it changes their life for the worse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He also said that Candyman's uh, thrust is metaphysical instead of political. 
Uh, he goes on to say, my element of social criticism asks how people can be expected to live in squalor because the housing authority has allowed Cabrini Green to rot instead of trying to maintain it. But Candyman really poses the question that if God exists because we believe in him, what would happen to him if the worship ceased? Would there be a five-minute period where God is running on belief, and would he try to win his followers back? Uh, huh. That's, I guess that's something that, you know, for anybody out there who deals into magic with a K, I mean, that's the whole point is that if you believe in, like, an entity, then they exist. Yeah. yeah. She's getting a nice brew and a smoke here. <laughs> yeah, you can't blame her. Yeah. She smokes a lot in this movie. It was the 90s. Where yeah. People still smoked in movies. Yeah, in, indoors all the time. Yep. I don't miss that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I used to do that a lot. Especially, you know, we, we mentioned Hellraiser 3, Anthony Hickox. Oh, yeah, jeez. He was a smoker. And then, yeah. and look how many people are smoking in Hell, Hell, Hellraiser 3. Yeah. And also, another thing that shows you this is the 90s, you know, uh, slide projector. Slide. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I've, I've got one of those. Gosh. Nowadays, you even have, like, little Pico projectors that you can put on a phone or yeah. something. Yeah. At least I know of a company that's that's trying to make a 4K Pico projector. That's going to be like a small thing you could you could hold in your hand. I like this scene because it's very it's, it's quiet. There's no music or anything. Yeah. It's just reminds me of that Blade Runner scene. Um, oh well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. He's going through that's his fun. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Telling that the thing that like uh, it was like a special machine that you know you spoke to it. I like in movies when they they they're comfortable enough to let something take some time, something like yeah. this. And it doesn't like that she's enhancing so much anymore. They don't yeah. do that. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. I love that she's enhancing the projection. Yeah. To see like Candyman, she's putting him into focus, even though he's like maybe a, a, a few pixels right. wide. Then then she focuses on him, and you can tell it's Tony yeah. Todd. Yeah, that's a little bit of a cheat since the picture's not going <laughs> to yeah. change. No. Yeah. <laughs> You can't focus on the well. Nowadays, you can. I mean, there's cameras who have that uh, light tunnel technology where yeah. you can choose where to focus in the picture after you've taken it, which is oh, wow. mind blowing to me. There's another good scare. So I guess how this works is that once you summon him, he'll come and he'll kill and he'll go away, and then you have to summon him again because. Yeah. Except for Helen, I mean, he's pretty mad that she uh, that she she's taking his congregation away from him. Right. So he's gonna he's gonna go take her along on a murder spree and and uh, make everyone believe again. That scene with the hook coming out through the closet was a little cheap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Eddie Murphy's voice would not be the same. You know, it, Tony Todd's voice has got a really kind of like hypnotic sound to it. Yeah, yeah even and, if they, you know, distorted that voice of Eddie Murphy's, it still wouldn't look so. Yeah. And the the way they uh, they do the sound design for his voice, it seems like they put the, his voice in the in the foreground. Mm. You know, like like he's it looks like it yeah. sounds like he's talking right in your ear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even though he's even though he's like ten feet away or whatever. You know, I have to say, I do understand what you were bringing up earlier, Ryan, that uh, there's a baby missing and they let Helen go back home. Yeah. 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 Keep an eye on her. Or they'd have a police police outside her door. Well, and they, they said that they were letting her go because they want to get her for murder, but they have to find the body of the baby first. Right. So oh. here, with the, the she, gets, uh, she gets framed for Bernadette's murder, but obviously that kill wasn't done with a butcher knife i was gonna say yeah it just it's obvious it's not a knife and that knife wouldn't even have the her bernadette's blood on it also didn't you just say there was a police officer outside her house no i said i, I thought they should if they're okay. gonna if you're gonna oh, right, yeah. you know let her go you should have a police officer right. come with her but sure keep, keep an she, eye i'm sure her. she doesn't go to mexico or something tijuana 
Yeah, God. <laughs> to hook up with Pinhead. I, I'm so yeah. glad that we're done with that movie now. We may never have to watch it again. I'm never going to watch it again. Just <laughs> we've got, yeah, Hel- right. we've got <laughs> Hellraiser Judgment coming up. That's, that's bad enough, pro- theoretically. I think it's very realistic that she she can barely speak in this scene because yeah. sometimes when you're overcome with emotion, you can barely speak. Yeah, and that's that's a good. And she's she's fighting off uh, she's fighting off passing out too, right? Uh huh. Oh, poor Bernadette. Yeah, no, she didn't just, do anything. It's not wrong. saying. You, I think it's a. Uh, because you can imagine what how she's just getting torn to shreds. Yeah. Does your version have like a cutback to like Candyman's lair and the baby? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just really quick though. And she's holding the knife again. Oh, the knife does have blood all over it. Why does it have that? Candyman must have done it. Yep. I guess you could you could argue the point, um, just like in the the, the Universal Wolfman. Uh. Is that real or, you know, is is it all in her head, her head, I guess? For yeah. most of the movie, you can probably argue that yeah. it could be all in her head. Right. You don't like uh, injections? No. No, I... Okay. Yeah, I heard you go... Uh, well, yeah, uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, a doctor said, I'm going to take your blood, and I thought they were going to take all of my blood and kill me. Oh, wow. So I'm yeah, like, I said, are you going to give it back? And they're like, ha ha, you're so funny or whatever. But like, he didn't really answer my question. Okay. So ever since then, if I get blood drawn or whatever, I have to fight <coughs> off passing out. Okay. It's just, I just start getting dizzy and nauseous and stuff. Yeah, that's kind of something that happens to you as a kid can stay with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And here's a part where I think the music... Uh, the music takes over. I think this is one of the better yeah. pieces of uh, music that Philip Glass did. It's just kind of coming together, you know. Especially this this sort of synth music works really well when you you have driving scenes, you know. Yeah, yeah, and the and and the the helicopter too. And the the movie has been pretty silent so far. Yeah. Yeah, I love the slow pace of this movie, and and uh, the building tension, you know. Yeah, the long shots like that, you know. I mean, it, yeah, I miss that kind of stuff. How many movie, horror shots. movies would you have a, a, a would you have a character getting just you know riding along in a car for this long? Yeah, it's very it's all you're getting information told to you know. The, yeah, what, if you were well, they cut that part out from Lord of Illusions uh, when uh, Swan and yeah. Harry are car because they thought oh this is too long let's just yeah. cut it so i'm glad they didn't do that for this yeah poor baby anthony and this is one of those movies that you don't really need a director's cut because this is a director's cut you yeah. know nobody yeah. messed with it nobody fucked with the movie yeah as far as we know i don't remember ever hearing anything any about any kind of struggles like that and uh, Clive Barker said it, there's an interview on the at least on this special edition called uh, Raising Hell or Clive Barker colon Raising Hell, and he says that uh, with Candyman he wanted to be the kind of producer that he wished he had had on uh, Nightbreed. Oh, that's a good praise. Well, well, it's kind of nice Clive having Barker. having a producer that's fighting for you, for you to be able to make the movie that you want. Yeah. And uh, and I think that he did ar- have arguments with people sometimes as a producer, but it was always for the better of the movie, and they, he would listen to them mm-hmm. instead of dictating. Well, you know, unsurprisingly, because, I mean, he knows what he wants to see, but, for example, when he was a filmmaker, he when he did Hellraiser, he didn't even know the first thing about directing a movie. So yeah. I guess he had to rely a lot on assistant directors and photographers and stuff to yeah. let him know how to do it. Well, and, and uh, he ta- I think it was talked about with Midnight Meat Train, too, that he would kind of sit down and hash out stuff and argue a little bit with, like, uh, Ryuhei Kitamura. And mm-hmm. it was the same kind of the same kind of deal that they would just kind of hash stuff out, and eventually he would say, okay, well, this is your vision, so let's go for it. Mm-hmm. But I, I kind of wonder with The Plague if that sort of style of arguing and hashing stuff out didn't work for him. 
if he just took it like you know you're telling me what to do and... that that scene that we just saw um candy man looks like a dark angel just floating over oh him. yeah yeah i yeah. love that and what that's um, what uh what can we learn from the wicked except to learn from their excesses or something yeah. What do the good? What do the good teach us? Or what do the bad teach us? Except, I uh, yeah, I forget now too. So, Ask Cabrini Green. I wish that video had actually shown Candyman. I don't know. I just I don't like that everybody thinks she's crazy and a murderer. Because you like her, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's a little bit of an uh, inconsistency there because. Candyman does register on her photo, but she's the only one who sees it. So you you have to wonder: is she just seeing things because yeah, of Candyman, yeah. or it's in her mind? Because if he showed up in a picture, he would show up on a camera. But and yeah, and, you know. and and uh, Candyman lives right next door to Anne Marie. Why doesn't she hear Baby Anthony? <laughs> I never noticed that. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. She'd be like, "Wait, I think my baby's right there in the next door." Also, that hospital room is a little grimy on the walls. Yes. It reminds me of Chouinard, reminds me of Chouinard Institute or something. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, uh, this, this guy's a real jerk, the bald guy. They're going to Disneyland. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, he, yeah. and, he, uh, and he gives the, the guards a hard time, too. Like he's, like he's so awesome compared to them. He's like, what are you doing? Just reading a book over there? Well, it doesn't seem like this is a good hospital to begin with. Just look at <laughs> no. the dirty walls. Yeah. Good way to get a hospital infection. Yeah. So the cinematographer for this movie was Anthony Richmond. So this moment here is, I think, another one of the worst decisions by Helen. Oh well, yeah, actually like, say it. Yeah, uh, to say I oh I can uh, I can call him. I'll prove it to you. Like this is a guy that's trying to help her. <laughs> she well, get th it. This is her. But fault. That's her only proof, really. I mean, it's yeah. out of despair. Yeah, but at least get a bunch of people in there or something. Uh huh. <laughs> Again, it's it. I guess this hospital doesn't have a lot of staff. Yeah. She's been there for a month. I know, it's crazy. I need 50 cc's of Thorazine stat. Yes. They always say that in movies. Actually, yeah. uh, there was a there was a trivia thing on IMDb about that where the guy said like I need 100 I need 100 mils and they're like that's like gallons. <laughs> so so the guy said the wrong um, said the wrong dosage or whatever. 100 milliliters is like a third of a can of Coke. Or maybe he said, I need 1,000 mils or something like that. Yeah, 1,000 mils would be a liter. Yeah. That, that would be a lot of Thorazine. Yeah. Yeah, like this, this scene is just a little too slow, yeah. I guess. And why does he need four monitors for that? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. He's like a, he's know. got his own editing bay right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They could have uh, they could have saved money and bought one color monitor instead of four black and white ones. Yeah, gosh, and black and white monitors. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, the the whole idea of this would be, you know, ridiculous. Yeah. Now, this is a set, right? Because when he gets pulled back, Candyman, when he comes, makes his entrance, gets mm -hmm. pulled back through the... That is a... Yeah, a, this is a set. A, yeah. Yeah, that was one goof that they mentioned on IMDb, that you could see the wires on Candyman. But I'm kind of like... You yeah, can. Yeah, that's okay. It doesn't... I don't think it hurts the movie. Well, I mean... Sure. I mean, you know that he's not really flying, but it takes you out of... It's a little jarring to see the wires. I mean, it yeah. takes you out of the immersion in the movie. You're like, ah, there's the wires right there. 
I just don't think that he had to necessarily like crash through the window on his way out. Yeah. I mean, they could have just made him disappear or something. That's true. They, I think he wanted to show her the way to escape, maybe. Oh, okay. Or give her a way to, yeah. Yeah. Because he just takes off, like, flying backwards. It's like, here I go. Whee! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just goes through the window. And yeah. It, it is cool. Just weird. Oh, don't do it, Helen. Yeah, don't do this, it. This guy, is, in his own way, is just trying to help you. And look what you're doing. Have you guys ever said Candyman five times in the mirror? No, yes. I, won't, I won't do it. I have. <laughs> I've done it in the dark too. No, I'm I'm kind of superstitious about stuff. But Bloody I won't say. Mary. But I won't say Bloody Mary. That I will not say Bloody yeah. Mary. Okay. Well, I mean, it's you... funny because uh, for me, like, I didn't grow up in the U.S., so whenever I heard about Bloody Mary, I was like, "Oh, really? That's that's funny." Like, yeah. I I have no idea. I didn't hear that when I was a kid, so I guess I never stuck with that in my mind. <laughs> When I first saw this, that scared me. I was like, well, yeah. what the crap? Yeah. This was such a surprise. I mean, I... Yeah. Candyman just killed George Costanza. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. He does look like him. And, and he uh, Helen is acting all shocked. It's like, you you told, you told asked him to do this, is pretty much. What is the deal with Candyman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? What's up with that? Yeah. There we go. And letting you go. Yeah. And this is where it finally, you know, you can tell that she's not mad. It really Candyman exists. It's not just in her head because yeah. she got loose. How would she get loose without Candyman? Yeah. yeah. And there's no way to pin the murder on her this time. I'm sorry. I mean, she yeah. didn't have a weapon in there. Right. But it's still going to add to the mythology. Yeah, well, somehow she did. Yeah. And, and maybe... Or I guess they could say, oh, well, maybe he undid her, you know, restraints. I like this person. She's like a nurse. She knocks out and the person that they're helping. Is just the Boom. Face, the yeah. Look on her face. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Her fluttering eyelids. eyelids. Is that, that looks like Narcisse right there, that guy. Yeah, that guy. It's what I'm talking about. This is. Yeah, you know, uh he's going to go take me to Midian. There's yeah. There's been several doctors over history that have been attacked by their own patients, especially in uh, psychiatric situations. I guess one of the, the the ones that I heard about was um there was a Portuguese Nobel Prize of Medicine called Egas Muniz. He's supposed to be the guy who uh came up with the idea of the procedure for a, a lobotomy. He uh, got the Nobel Nobel Prize for uh, medicine for that. And, wow. Um, yeah, for the discovery of the therapeutic value of leucotomy in certain psychosis. That was, and then he was uh, shot by a patient in 1949. Oh, wow. Yep. That happens. Also, there's lo a lot of stories about psychiatric uh, doctors who end up becoming crazy themselves. Serial killers, yeah. Yeah, and they end up having to consult their own colleagues and be like, hey, I'm listening voices. You know, I read an article about that. It's pretty interesting. So she ran all the way home. Yeah, this is the saddest part of the movie. It's like, this is, yeah, this, this, this is, she's relying on Trevor and he's Trevor, so yeah. unreliable. Yeah, music. Trevor's like, haha, my wife's nuts in the loony bin. I'm just going to paint the walls pink and bring in my 20-year-old girlfriend. Yeah. Which the relationship would never last anyway. Oh, yeah. I mean, who the hell who the hell wants a house with the walls painted pink? I mean, for Christ's sake. I, it, I, it had to have been her idea. <laughs> yeah. He's just letting her do what she wants. I mean, did. you deal with property, Ryan. Have you ever seen a house with pink walls? Yes. Oh, my yeah, God. I've yeah, I've had tenants paint an apartment pink without asking me. Oh, my gosh. He's, you know, I, I love the way he comes in and just says, did you make a boo-boo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's so, you know, slimy. Yeah. He looks like he's got his little, he's got his robe on. He must have just got out of the shower. Yeah.
So at this point, Helen's kind of owning it, right? Like, she's like, okay, yeah. I'm not going to try to convince everybody that I'm innocent. I'm, you know. I love this line, the way she delivers it. It's scary. It's like, she's really intense in this scene, too. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. really good. She sort of goes back and forth between being intimidating and, and breaking down. God, Trevor's And then a... Stacy's just cowering in the corner. She's crying. Yeah. Whoop. I was thinking about going with the My Little Pony theme for the apartment. <laughs> let, let me rephrase that. I was thinking about going with the My Little Pony theme for the apartment. <laughs> yeah. And Trevor's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's great. Whatever you want to do. Oh, boy. Looks like right there she's laughing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. She's not a very good actress. <laughs> yeah. No, no, not really. Please don't kill me. Yeah. This is a, a very, you know, again, a very intense scene. I really like this scene. Me too. She should have yanked the cord out of the wall. Yeah, this might be one of the Clyde Barker adaptations with the best, best acting. Yeah. You know, I mean, even, I'm sorry, even considering, like, movies like Nightbreed and stuff, I think um, yeah. Yeah, acting in this yeah. movie is really good. Yeah, well, and, and I think that um, Nightbreed, Nightbreed is such a huge movie compared to, this is this is a way more intimate. Yeah. This is, so it's more like Hellraiser. Sure. Definitely, yeah, that's a good point. Well, yeah, I guess Hellraiser does have good acting, too, of course. Yeah, um, yeah you're right. I'm just surprised that nobody noticed her wardrobe on the way here. Maybe they thought she was just like a nurse going home with her scrubs. Yeah, yeah, maybe probably. So. Yeah. The police aren't don't do a very good job uh, trying to catch her. Yeah. This is another moment I like, where the Candyman's talking to her, and you got this music just. Yeah. You can tell it was it's cold. cold. It's, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. She's like, I should have grabbed a coat. Yep, that's the Randolph Street Bridge above the Chicago River. Oh. You can even see, like, the, the, the cold mist coming off from the water. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to Chicago for about a week one time for a convention, a realtor convention. Did you see that river? Uh, no. No, I, I went on the waterfront, though, the pier, and rode the giant uh, Ferris wheel and stuff. Oh, cool. And I had a Chicago hot dog. And well, Chicago like, pizza. Oh, that's great. Are those like, are they as good as they say they are in their yeah. own? Uh, oh, yeah, they're yeah. great. I never had a deep dish uh, I, pizza. I think that those deep dish pizzas are too much. Like, I, I would get a little personal pizza and I could only eat like one piece because it's, it's, yeah. it's a giant slab. It's too much cheese. Oh, sure. Well, nowadays you got those things that are wrapped in bacon. Oh, I know. <laughs> Oh, it's, those, it's crazy. Those... Like, coming here, I mean, in my country, in Europe, in Portugal, we don't have restaurant ads on TV all the time like we do here in America. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe the only food ads that I remember seeing in Portugal were McDonald's, Burger King. Oh, Because yeah. that's what they do here. You know, that's what they... But here, it's like they bombard like you with so many, so yeah. many, like, commercials for food. It's just insane. Yeah, and and food is so gimmicky. Like Kentucky Fried Chicken's gotten super gimmicky, and and Pizza Hut, and Taco why does Bell Hardee's, too. Why does Hardee's? Why does Hardee's? Why do, I mean Hardee's. Uh, I don't mean to get on a tangent here, but Hardee's. Uh, they sell their hamburgers with sexy women doing sexy things. Oh really? Oh right, Carl's Jr. and Hardee's, right? Yeah. Yeah. But usually, like Fourth of July, there was like some commercial with a woman with a bikini with the red flag eating a hot eating a hamburger yeah. in a, a truck and it's all like Paris, fireworks. Paris Hilton yeah. watching a car or eating a hamburger. Yeah, it's strange. strange. Hey, it works, I guess. I haven't seen okay. any, any commercials since Joey was born. You're not missing anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So finally, Helen is taking matters into her own hands. Yeah. 
It's like, well, let's let's see what we can find here. Yeah. I'm pretty, that doesn't look like a set. That looks like they really shot at a... Yeah, in a condemned building. A dilapidated apartment. Yeah. and Or like a factory or abandoned factory. Yeah, or something. something like that. So I guess maybe if she's going this far away, I guess maybe baby Anthony is kind of far away from Anne-Marie. But I thought it was just through that little doorway or through that little hole. If Cisco would have noticed them, the paintings, that's how he had that coat back then. Yeah. And th- this painting oh. style is a lot different from the painting style in, like, Candyman 3. Right, because I guess it's supposed to be done by his followers, right? Like yeah. Like, different people. Yeah. Uh, obviously, oh. Candyman wouldn't be painting his own death. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. So you guys wanted to know locations. I actually found some locations. Like, the opening credits... Um, of a helicopter shot over a road that's Interstate 290 going westbound out of Chicago. Oh. Um, Helen's apartment building, uh, southeast corner of North LaSalle Street and West Schiller Street, Chicago. That amphitheater that we saw from the air that yeah, she that was I... walking, that's in University of Illinois Chicago campus. Oh, okay. Cool. On 1200 Harrison Street. So nice. Candyman actually takes snaps. He's like a vampire, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he awakens only when, like, people t- talk about the... Well, no, that wouldn't make any sense. Oh, like when he... Only when he they say his name? Yeah. But that... Yeah, there's no reason for him to be asleep uh, except for her to surprise him here. Yeah. yeah. I love that little squirt of blood that just yeah. shoots out. Also, another location, going to the uh, rundown apartment building, Cabrini Green Housing, that was located on uh, the, the particular building they shot was on West Walton Street, just west of North or- Orleans Street in Chicago. Um, I never noticed that, but he's crying in this thing. Yeah, yeah I he's, never like, noticed he, that. He's, he's really happy that she came back. Yeah. There's even the location for the disgusting bathroom, southwest corner of oh. North Orleans Street and West Walton Street, Chicago. Oh, okay. Uh, no, it doesn't really look like that. This place has been torn down, and now there's a church standing on its location. Of that bathroom? Yes. It's the Church of Candyman. <laughs> and, and, and Jake yeah. is the is the pastor. That's kind of weird. Yeah. A very sexual kind of, you know, hook, you know. Uh, yeah. Oh, and you were asking uh, oh, if sure. they shot in Cabrini Green. Actually, uh, the exterior hallway and stairway scenes were actually filmed for a few days in the infamous Cabrini Green housing projects. Oh, wow. Though the producers had to make a deal with the ruling gang members to put them in the movie as extras to ensure the cast and crew's safety during filming. Ah. They, even those with were, this arrangement, those were real gang members. <laughs> yeah, they even with this look, arrangement, look, yeah. a sniper put a bullet through the production van on the last day of filming, though no one was injured. Ugh. Ah, oh, the famous bee kiss. Yeah, holy cow. I mean, people, oh people ask uh, Tony Todd about the bees all the time, but she had Virginia Madsen had to do it too. You know what's really funny? I'm watching it with subtitles and the sound turned off. And when they were kissing, the oh, <laughs> a, a subtitle popped up saying "scrunching." Yeah, Ugh. yeah, it did really make us like a bee crushing sound. Yeah. Um, he uh, said uh, on the Blu-ray that Scream Factory put out for the second film, he they have a, about a 30-minute interview with Tony Todd. He said the all the bees had their own. Own names. <laughs> That's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Tony Todd also said to Cindy Perlman of the Chicago Sun Times in 2011, "I'll never forget that I filmed that movie in a building on the south side of Chicago, Building 116, Unit C. That's the Candyman pad." <laughs> Guess doesn't matter because Cabrini Green has already been imploded years ago. I, and I did an interview on, I think, episode number eight with Tony Todd. And we talked a little bit about the bees. Oh, that's right. And and uh, Valerie on the stairs. We talked about that, too. Oh, that's a, a good one. We should probably, uh, that would be a, go- a cool idea to make a commentary for that in the future. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know why we didn't think of it. Heichel's tail and Valerie on the stairs. Yeah. I think Valerie's uh, Valerie on the stairs is a really, really good episode of the Masters of Horror. I yeah. guess I like that one a little more than I did Heckle's Tale. Yeah. Heckle's Tale, I mean, if you read the short story, it doesn't really seem like something that should be adapted into a movie. Yeah. And uh, the script uh, for Valerie on the Stairs was actually published in parts at Revelations. Clive Barker oh, wow. got in. I think I'll so go this? visit Anne Marie right now. He might as well, you're right there. He could just knock on our door and say, hey, how's it going? Remember me? That bonfire, um, when they sh shoot him from above, it looks like just a pile of garbage. doesn't look nearly as big as when they actually go there. Oh, yeah. And that's that's not a bonfire. That's a mountain. I know. <laughs> it's like, and it's all, there's like metal desks and stuff in there. Mattresses. Yeah. That's nuts. Candyman was kind of a jerk to put baby Anthony in there. If, if she had, if he had just rescued the baby or, you know, got the baby back to Anne Marie, then she would have said, yeah, you can kill me now. Well, you have to think this is like a supernatural transfer thing that Candyman does because otherwise people would have heard the baby scream. Yeah. You know, along the day. I mean, it's, it's like he just started crying now to get her attention. Yeah, it's yeah. like Candyman just transported the baby there and is waiting for her. Yeah, someone like threw it. a bike in there. Yeah. yeah, bikes. There's all kinds of crap in there. Yeah, stuff that's not really that flammable. I like I like the kid. Like uh... there's a toaster in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sounds like Candyman is haunting someone's desk. Yeah. Yeah. So, the thing that I take out of this is that the the kid says he's here, and then he calls his friends, and they all go with gasoline and stuff. But wasn't that bonfire meant to be for, like, a party or something? Like, some yeah. sort of festival or whatever? Yeah, but I think it's like he, he convinced them that Candyman was in the bonfire, and they, they all want to be rid of him. I guess, yeah. I saw his hook. Yeah. Hey, no, you didn't. Like the lunch, the lunch first. <laughs> I'm just candy man. Burn him. Yeah. Curious to know how they shot these scenes. Yeah. Uh, the, the inside the awfully was controlled on the set somewhere. Cabrini glad, Green's Burning Man. I'm glad that Candyman tur didn't turn into a direct to sequel or direct to video franchise like Hellraiser. It kind of did a little bit. Well, it only went, uh, only a short. I mean, only a, only one bad movie. Sure. That's not too terrible. I mean, I think that. Uh, okay. Unpopular question. Would you guys be up for a Candyman remake? No. Okay. I heard they were going to do one, but I wasn't in favor of it. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. This movie's really good. Yeah. I would I would like to see Candyman return, though, in some form. Yeah. I just... What's Although the, the, the story really... Yeah, like, yeah, you're right. What is there to say? Um... I, I like the idea of remaking a movie that, you know, was really hard or they didn't quite get it right the first time because of technology mm -hmm. or whatever. But I mean, sure. I, but I'm not I'm not talking about a remake anymore. I'm talking about I would like to see it return somehow. But yeah. but like Rob was saying, yeah, Rob, you're coming in very very low. Yeah, Rob, we we can't really hear you. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Uh, yeah, that's better. Oh my God! Hair's on fire. Yeah. So yeah. they're trying to help her, and and they realize at least that she rescued the baby. But do they hear Candyman right now? Were y'all surprised that she died? I didn't really think she would die, but when I saw her burn like that, I was like, man, she's really messed up. Yeah. Yeah. 
I figured that she would die because when that beam on fire fell on her, I was like, well, she's done. Yeah. Yeah, that's all the, 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 those yeah, are. She's really kind of a, a martyr. Yeah. That's a really cool effect. I like that shot. And, and this is another sort of Clive Barker um, theme that, that Helen kind of caused all these problems with Candyman by doubting him and by, you know, snooping around with him. But she also was kind of the savior at the same time. I just wish they didn't show this shot of the burning corpse at the end because I'm like, you, you can't really burn a ghost, you know? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, would, I would have been happy with the, the bees yeah. burning, but yeah. showing that body burning in there, it's yeah. just seems out of place. And the director is right, coming up here in a second. He has a cameo. Oh, really? Oh, is he the guy standing next to Purcell? Yeah. There's yeah, there's somebody in the credits named uh what is it? Archie Walsh. So who's Archie? I guess that might be him. Yeah. I think he was in that earlier scene when they were all talking about, you know. Oh, candy sitting around at dinner. I think mm -hmm. he was. There he is. Yeah. Maybe he's Archie. Well, does IMDb list his name as Archie Walsh? Uh, I don't know. I just saw the credits said Archie Walsh, but I didn't. Yes, I, it is. Bernard Rose. I just okay. checked. Yes, that's him. It's kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, I know that uh, they think about all the backstory for their movie a lot, but for the director to actually give his cameo character a name, that just seems unnecessary, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there might have been an Archie character in the short story. Uh -huh. Maybe that's why. Okay, that looks sounds like familiar. Green green. Yep, they're green all green you're, green. You're, you're all late. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for her, you know. Nobody yeah. really came to her funeral, you know. I mean, I like no fam no family. Or, yeah. yeah And that's the real Candyman hook, not the one that Helen dropped on the ground. Clunk. Yeah. So, what was your take on the ending, Ryan? That this was them paying respect to her? Yeah, that that was the question. Are they paying respect and saying, "Hey, you saved, uh, you know, baby Anthony," or are they saying, "Oh, we know you're the you're the real Candyman." So the. The message that you just sent me while we were watching this, Rob, you were talking about the ending, and it says here, the ending of Candyman did change, though. The shot was supposed to go through the painting, and we would see Helen stuck in the wall covered in bees. Uh, I guess you're talking about the painting that's going to show up at the end here. Yeah. But this part would have been the same, then, with her coming back and Trevor and all that? Not no, sure. After all, the, after all this happens. Oh, oh okay. okay. No, it didn't, because it... Stacy's got a uh, see-through shirt. Yeah, yeah, and no bra. Yeah, yeah no bra. She was just wearing mom jeans. Yeah. That's and right. She's, she's really mad. She knows that big ass like a uh, uh, pen on the wall. <laughs> she must be like a very artsy party girl. It's like a big pen, like what do you call it? Like a uh, how to keep when you keep papers together. Oh what do you yeah. Call it? It's like. Clip a clip. Sorry, not a pen, yeah. but a clip. Paper clip. He's like, why oh why did I think with my dick? Yeah, I know. He's yeah. I, I feel for Trevor in this moment a little bit. He's, yeah. The actor makes it, you know, does a good job of portraying a guy. It's like, well, man, I really fucked her over. Yeah. I like I like the way she's like uh, handling the meat. Yeah, and the knife. Yeah, it's a good kind of yeah cross between you know what's gonna happen and her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean, Ryan. Here, what she says, oh, Helen, five times. It, it does seem a little forced that when you when you hear it. I mean, yeah. usually people just say like three times or something and mean like, oh, or once. whatever, whatever, yeah. whatever. The five times seems, and why does he turn the light while he's still in there? I guess he doesn't want to see himself cry. Or maybe he's thinking back to the Candyman myth, which is the most yeah. likely explanation. That, yeah, if you do, if you think about it that way, it's not too bad. 
I like this this uh, her turning into like uh, the Candy Man or the Candy Woman. Yeah, yeah. She, but she, the, the, but this Candy, her, the, the Helen Candy Man never comes back. I was wondering she, if they ever did try. See that big uh, clipper on the wall there? Oh the yeah, wall. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man, she messed him up. Man. Okay, bring the super soaker with the blood. We gotta yeah. hose this place down. Yeah, they did. We, that would have been fun. We, yeah, we, we just painted that bathroom pink. In the original ending, I think is at the painting. It would go into this. It would kind of uh-huh. show her covered in the bees. Covered in bees. Not the bees. Virginia yeah. Madison said. Uh, Virginia Madison said she went through hell for that shot, but then they didn't use it. Yeah. Oh. So Candyman is a, you know, really, it's a timeless classic. Classic, it'll hold up probably long after we're gone, all gone. Yeah. This will be, you know, so. Yeah. I wonder I wonder if this painting was done after they took her out of the bonfire and then the people of Cabrini Green decided to honor her. Giving her a painting, you know. Yeah. Give us more painting. and Yeah, I like that. Uh, okay. I'm curious to know. I'm, I was wondering they... Wonder why they never went with a sequel about her. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe that would have been more interesting. I don't know. Maybe Virginia Madsen didn't want to do it, or just like uh, Claire Higgins didn't want to be the evil yeah, Julia yeah. for. I guess you know, yeah, that's a good point. It, Carpet uh, Barker likes to uh, have female, pro- you know, protagonists. Yeah, yeah protagonists. Yeah, and... but the but the audience wouldn't have wanted that. I mean, they would have wanted Candyman to come back. Yeah. Uh, Bernard Rose did say he adapted a, a screenplay for Candyman 2, but it was really Midnight Meat Train. It, yeah, you know, it was, it was called Candyman. <laughs> Candyman 2 calling the Midnight Meat Train, and Clive Barker was like, how are you like, expecting to do this? Yeah, I was, I'd be curious to read that script. I yeah. mean, did, he even have, did he even mention Candyman in it? I mean, did he? Yeah. So That um, seems like it would have been a real struggle to, to uh, mix it together and make it work. Yeah. So there you go. There was some computer-generated imagery by Digital Magic. Yeah. Maybe the, those scenes with the, the bees coming out of the bonfire and stuff like that. Image Gary animation. Gary. Supervisor Gary J. Tunnicliffe. Yeah. Hmm. I guess like that's when it that. kind of splintered off from image animation and he started doing his own thing. What's the they had of- set security. Yaji's bodyguards and security. And there were two, <laughs> two bee wranglers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Rob. Sorry for interrupting you. No, you're fine. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, what is the name of uh, Gary's uh, fax company now? But I think it was the... Two Hours in the Dark. Okay. Oh. Chicago Post-production for... accounting. Entertainment accounting. And think. <laughs> <laughs> I always wonder what these people do, like the gaffer and the best boy and the best boy grip. I, I never know yeah. what this is. I mean, I know what dolly grip is, but yeah, I, I need to uh, read more into uh, what these things are. Yeah, some of them are like gophers, but I don't really understand exactly what the distinction is between those different ones. So there you go. Post-production sound facilities was Skywalker Sound, a yeah. division of LucasArts Entertainment Company. Yep. He checks. So this is a Star Wars movie, basically. <laughs> I think everybody uses that still. This oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that Disney doesn't own that, right? It's still George Lucas. Yeah. They don't yep. didn't buy that. Well, I really enjoy this. Uh, Ryan, do you have that link to the YouTube uh, Siskel and Ebert video? Oh, uh, yeah, I can put that in there. If you didn't. Okay. Uh, did you put it in the notes already? No, I didn't. Okay. I'll, I'll put it in the uh, podcast. Uh, I sent a link in the podcast uh, message. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we have some show notes here that we're going to put after this. And, uh, you know, again, thanks for joining us for this commentary track of, co- of Candyman. And I hope you enjoyed it. Have a yeah. good Halloween. Yeah, next one yeah, have a- Candyman 2. Yeah, have a great Halloween, guys. Uh, we'll see you after Halloween. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. 
Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.